Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. I think building your community within, especially queer networks, oh my God, queer disabled mutual aid is the most heartwarming, beautiful thing I have experienced in my time on this earth. And if I die like tomorrow, I would just like to say that I'm very grateful for like the queer, neurodivergent, intersectional identities, especially QT BIPOC, like queer people of color, oh my God, like we are there for each other. Welcome to this episode of Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. I'm your host, Sarah Shaw, Associate Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Community Outreach at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. I have been living with chronic migraine for almost 10 years, and I'm very open about navigating life with my chronic disease journey, as well as my experience living with anxiety. This podcast will be a window into other patients' lives as they navigate their own journeys living with chronic pain, migraine, and mental health. Today, we're joined by Krista, a deaf doula and community care facilitator. Welcome to the show, Krista. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. It's nice to be here. (laughs) No problem at all. And also, it's June, so happy Pride. Happy Pride. Yes, I think it would be remiss to not mention that given that I am queer and you know you are queer as well. (laughs) So celebrating our pains through, I mean, it is a painful month too for people for Pride. I don't want to like discourage or erase that history. It's a powerful moment. Thank you for having me on to share my story and also just being queer and being alive is, and I'll say this often, I think, but one of the things that I think, especially for us queer people with disabilities, and like migraine and stuff, you know, our existence is resistance, especially as like queer people of color. When people tell me, oh, what's the gay agenda? And I'm like, my gay agenda is just to live, just to be my authentic queer self. That's what we're here to do. My gay agenda is to live and make sure that other people who are like us or share similar intersectional identities, right? That's why I do death do the work. It's why I do like patient care advocacy stuff and like community care facilitation. See, there we go. I do community care facilitation because of seeing the gaps in our community, especially when it comes to healthcare and being queer. Absolutely. And also being people of color. So yeah, thanks for having me here. No problem. That's why you're here today. And I know you kind of already hinted at it a little bit about your career and your passions as a death doula and as a community care facilitator. How does that relate to your chronic illness, such as migraine and even jobs that you've had in the past? How has migraine kind of intersected into that? And maybe also where has it taken you or what things have you had to kind of pivot from? Sure. So I would say the migraine hit. I've always had migraine. I think throughout the years, it was just something that I didn't really notice. Right. We don't really think of migraine, especially if you don't have the language for it and you don't have someone pointing it out to you. So I always thought they were headaches. And I also didn't realize that I was suffering from them because of hormonal changes. And I allude to this, I have many overlapping disabilities and chronic illnesses. And I think migraine kind of went to the backside of the like health stuff because I was dealing with so many other compounding things. But specifically migraine in terms of my health journey is like I had migraines, I think like one of the first symptoms of my endo, endometriosis for those who are not familiar. But with endometriosis, we don't really know how it works, but there is part in the cycle where your hormones just drop. And when I had, I basically had an IUD, it wasn't enough hormone to suppress those symptoms, which is how I found out I had endometriosis or am finding out. But in the process of having a quote unquote regular cycle again on this IUD, I would have debilitating migraines right before my period. Like about the two to three days before my period, I would be hit suddenly with a migraine and it's debilitating. I mean, that's the one word that I would be using for it is it's debilitating because then I just like I can't concentrate. There is this pain in my head that lingers and throbs and and has a life there. And it's hard, too, because I have to compound with the like I have GI symptoms of my endometriosis. So like I throw up, I throw up. And this month I started a new IUD. I switched IUDs. The mood's not great, but migraine has been less, which is good. 
it. I still have to take like triptan ahead of time to be able to combat those migraine during my period and PMDD. So it's hard. Like I don't always know that the migraine is going to set in unless I'm really keeping diligent track of my cycle. And that's hard now too because I'm still adjusting to a new medication in the IUD. So migraine happens. It's debilitating. It's been happening for years, probably since high school, which is like when I started menstruating and such. And I think it's been interesting because I also watched the journey of I can't talk about my health journey without talking about my genetic component of it. And I remember watching my mother when I was younger, when she was still in her menstrual cycle, she would have really bad migraines. As a child, I guess I didn't realize how bad it was, but now that I'm an adult and am feeling in similar things that she's feeling, I was like, wow, I do not know how you handled being a parent with debilitating migraine like that because I'm like, she is a working mom. She doesn't have migraine anymore, which is great because she's after menopause, which is awesome. But I asked her about it when I found out. And obviously with also like work and such and jobs and stuff, it's really hard for me to like look at screens for a long time when I'm on my migraine. So migraine days, I kind of like take the time off. And that was a kind of trouble for like the past work that I've done, which was mostly in person in clinic, working with patients or like working on research stuff on my downtime. And sometimes it's like, I don't have the energy to look online or like, I don't have the energy to like get out of bed physically because I have to like, I need to throw up. And then I also need to just like deal with this migraine that's not going away with painkillers, over-the-counter painkillers, ibuprofen. I think the triptans were the only thing that really helped. But even that is like, I have to catch it like right when it's happening or else I can't rein it in anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a balancing act. As someone who also lives with endometriosis and my migraine is heavily affected by my menstrual cycle, I'm also on an IUD. Yeah. It is a juggling act trying to catch both things. And if you live with more than two chronic illnesses, you know multiple things. Like I know that you also live with diabetes and all of these other things that you have to really carefully do the right recipe, right, to get it just right so that you're not suffering in too much pain. And I kind of wanted to go back to what you were saying about your mother, about how did she do it? Like, how did she live for so long in so much pain? And I think you and I had this conversation earlier about, Mm -hmm. you know, first generation immigrants, and you kind of don't know what you don't know. And when you're in survival mode, it's weird how the body will sometimes go into this whole mode to get through, but then it's going to come down at some point. And I think, like you said, if you can catch it early, if you can get on the right treatment, if you can find accommodating work that, you know, works for you, I know that you had to kind of pivot and now you work for yourself. How has that kind of helped you? I know it doesn't lessen your migraine attacks, but how has that helped you kind of navigate out of the in-person nine to five looking at screens all the time? So that's a great question. I think that is constantly evolving, obviously as I work with my disabilities and work with the endometriosis and I mean straight up as someone who is full of I like to say like I am now just like a crip soldier I have this endometriosis that leads to PMDD which is like oh my god you're not even thinking about that because the PMDD has migraine and component involved in GI stuff people with endometriosis normally also have like really bad IBS or like GI symptoms so it's like I'm dealing with that and I had that for years and I never really understood and then there was the diabetes component which is also genetic and that is also like the PCOS and they're all kind of basically like hormones Hormones are very important. And now that we're in a time that a lot of external environment stuff and like epigenetic stuff can happen to us and also intergenerational trauma, like we feel it in our bones. And it really is hard because I know other people aren't as privileged as me. And I acknowledge that. Like I come from a family that made their money as immigrants and worked really hard for it to resource my brother and myself when they came to America. But because they're in survival mode and resourcing and trying to provide for their children, they also didn't really teach us how to manage our symptoms. And it's weird because both my brother and my dad are physicians. So you would think that having doctors in the family really helps you connect with your body. And it does in certain ways. But I think the cultural component of being part of this large diaspora that focuses on community care and those layers of components of like, I've seen my parents and my family like work really hard to get where they are. I don't have that privilege and luxury because of my body. I am lucky 
to have them. But the work that I do for myself now is mainly very community based. It happens because I have the privilege to work on my health and to work on on building a community through advocacy. So it's been helpful in that way because I can leverage what I do best, which is like networking and community stuff. Most of my days now are kind of spent on finding more sustainable ways to build an income like passively or actively without having to talk to like 20 clients plus a week. And so part of that is like writing and part of that is providing resources and doing talks and being an advocate. Definitely. I appreciate a lot of what you said in terms of pivoting and green time and having to navigate yourself to accommodate the world instead of the world accommodating us. And I feel like accommodating you before yeah. I've always dealt with menstrual issues from probably the first time that I started menstruating. So I was unfortunately I was very experienced in doing dealing with chronic pain at a young age. But that was kind of became the status quo of, oh, okay, you have a uterus and you bleed and you have cramps and that's just what it is. And I internalized that. And it really wasn't until I started getting these severe migraine attacks that I was like, this is not that it's worse, but it really like put my thoughts and feelings into perspective in terms of the healthcare system and navigating it and having to speak up and having to advocate and being afraid to advocate. I'm a, you, you said that you're an extroverted introvert so am i i also have like anxiety so like speaking yeah. up at a doctor's office is just like hello it's me like so i really had to yeah. train myself to be comfortable in those situations and it really was from other community members helping me and advocating with me or for me or my partner who comes with me to doctor's appointments if i'm going to a new provider to make sure i don't forget anything or something like that so i really appreciated what you said about community support you touched on polyamory and the awesome like support system that you have and i know for some people living with any chronic illness really not not just migraine or endometriosis, sometimes having a support system is hard to come by. For you, what does support look like from your loved ones as it pertains to chronic illness and kind of supporting you, whether it's your family members, your partners, your friends? And second follow up, was it kind of hard to start those conversations? Oh, my God, absolutely. And I also just want to like briefly say that like a lot of the stuff we're talking about right now is in one of my favorite books called Care Work. Highly recommend it. They talk about like care pods and a lot of the work that I'm doing is kind of based off of these CRIP and disability justice frameworks and I apply them to non-monogamy and, and my life. So I'm very happy about it. But yeah, I think right now that question is a little tender and tough. I'm going through kind of a transition with one of my partners where we are uh, separating, which is hard, but they've been a huge support. One of the things that I really loved about them and I still love about them is their dedication to within their means were able to like show up for my appointments if my, you know, I have a spouse and I live with the spouse and my spouse and I have been together for a decade now in September. We've been married for a little and about six months now officially. Congrats. Thank you. It was just a legal thing. <laughs> <laughs> we needed benefit for the insurance. Yeah. One of the the things about being disabled is that some Medicaid can be awesome, but Medicaid really severely limits a lot of the options you have and it takes up a lot of time. I know all about it. <laughs> well, I'm sure like other people have too. And so we really got married for the health insurance. So that's one of the things that they provide me. I have help from my family of like financial stability. My spouse is the breadwinner and, you know, we have dogs, which is also like having emotional support dogs is helpful. They're quiet right now, which I think is really funny. Normally they're like screeching and screaming all the time. But one of the things also is like being and I want to touch on this of like this support of like when you're disabled or like dealing with chronic illness, you have these moments and waves of like I can help and no, I can't. I can help and self-preservation. So that is for people who are disabled, mutual aid for us looks very simple and it's very small and sometimes it can be very casual. It's like being in a group chat with some of my best friends, there's like, I have a number of group chats, but there's one in particular where two of my really close friends, we check in with each other every day. Um, we're all kind of struggling through it. The other two people in the chat don't identify as disabled and are dealing with like a lot of stress and we check with each other every 
every morning we go, hey, squad, how's it going? What's up? What's like your plans? One thing that I like to do because I physically can't really show up for people the way that they want to is I put a lot of myself mentally and I do a lot of this work because it sustains the community. And it's like, I know I'm putting this because you're in a moment of crisis. And I feel like the people, because I love and give so hard and want to see people friggin' survive, <laughs> essentially, is like, just to live life is that I put that into there. I make sure that like I'm kind of the person who steps back, especially in crisis. Like I step back and I look at someone's life and I was like, all right, you have a gap of care here. You have a gap of care here. How can we utilize your resources and privileges that you have in order to fill those gaps for a little bit? And like, what can I do to help you facilitate that? And I think in giving that, I get an abundant amount in return. We all have our own ambitions and dreams and priorities that we're coming in, but we are gathered around the central cause. And I think community is being with people who like it's a little smaller. We're all geared towards the same belief. And so it's from collectives of people and from gatherings of people. I have been more discerning about who I let into my community. And part of that is also building like care plans for yourself and like decolonizing our view on family and community and my chosen family. Like these people, especially like during this very tough transition for me as I'm going through a breakup with a partner, these people just like show up at my house. We joke that like because of also my illness and because I've been dealing with stuff, people in order to spend time with me have just shown up at my house. They just show up. And they're like, hey, what's up? What can I do for you? Can I bring you a little treat? Little treats are great. I single-handedly think I fuel the treat-based economy besides dogs. And I think that's what I also try to do for my people. So it's really cultivating and discerning who do you trust enough to be able to like show up for you, even if it's in small ways. Absolutely. Some of my friends are like, hey, like you've been inside too much. Why don't we go outside and like take a walk and touch grass and like sit in nature? And I think having those reminders, especially if you're in like flight mode, which I don't know how extreme your migraine can be or like when you have pain, but it's like sometimes when you're working through stuff, it really debilitates you and it really puts you in a spot where you just don't want to move. I'm really lucky to live with a partner who cares so much about me and like is willing to pick up the slack where other people might not be able to or haven't seen that. I really appreciate my spouse for a lot of things, but especially because he is the main caretaker of me right now. And I think without that steady foundation and that I'm polyamorous, like I think multiple people can fill multiple roles and some people can't fill the roles that you might need. But being in community and living my life in this kind of decolonized way and I'm part of the diaspora. I grew up even though we touched upon this earlier of like my parents might not believe in like mental health culture and like going to therapy and even like with migraine too, right? When we talked about like, oh, I had these pains and like people didn't believe me because I have X, Y and Z identity. Like you and I both appear to be femme, like people of color. And so people automatically are not going to believe us and our pain. They read us differently. Yeah. And I'm fat as well. So that adds another component to it of like, oh, you're in pain. You just need to lose like 20 pounds. And it's like, do I need to lose 20 pounds to not have a migraine? Like, No, you wouldn't tell a skinny person that if they came in being like, hey, my head hurts, mm -hmm. especially a cis white man. Uh, Ooh, yeah, I don't want it to be like hateful against the cis heads, but it's just they have an advantage that we don't have, especially because we openly appear to be different and outsiders. And and so I think also building your community within especially queer networks. Oh, my God. Queer disabled mutual aid is the most heartwarming, beautiful thing I have experienced in my time on this earth. And if I die like tomorrow, I would just like to say that I'm very grateful for like the queer, neurodivergent, fat, whatever intersectional identities of especially QT BIPOC, like queer people of color. Oh, my God. Like we are there for each other. I think there was only one employer that I've had in the past 10 10 years who like really sat down and was like, hey, if you have migraine, you need to go see a doctor and you need to write a note. Like if you need these accommodations or like your head should not be getting in the way of work. And I was like, oh, OK, you're right. It's so hard navigating all of that. I appreciate what you said about how you get support and how you're supported, whether it's through your friends, your partner, your spouse, little things. It really goes a long way. And I think 
think for people who maybe weren't born like with a disability or chronic illness and then suddenly in their early mid 20s, like we go through this like weird phase of people, at least for me, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but for me, I went through this really weird phase of I had endo, but it wasn't diagnosed until I was like 27, maybe 28. Yeah. But my friends in college and high school, they knew me as this like hyper energetic, like do anything kind of person. And then I graduated and then I had my first migraine attacks and they just they started to get worse and worse. And suddenly, like there was this transition of me really having to, like you said, put care into who I put my time and energy into for people who couldn't understand or empathize or show up for me in the way that I showed up for them. And it's been a journey. It hasn't been easy, but I really, really appreciate community. I really appreciate the QT BIPOC community, the disability community. I've learned so much and I have been shown so much empathy and support and understanding that like I haven't experienced in other spaces before. And I just was really vibing and nodding along to what you were saying about community sport. It's so crucial and it's so important. And I'm also sitting here from a place of privilege of being able to work for an employer who understands that I have migraine, understands that I need to take sick days where I can't look at screens too much. I hope that we can navigate to a world where we have less migraines we have less like sickness and we have accommodating employers and you were talking about burnout and exhaustion and I am an anxious ball of energy I have been since I was young due to trauma but <laughs> trauma that's the one of the keys it's... that's the word <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> what do you do that kind of help center you bring you back on those really hard days or even before or leading after I know for migraine there's like the post drum with endo you know sometimes you need a few days to really recuperate and recharge what are some things that makes you feel more like yourself or close to your regular symptom level it's a good question just because like on days that are bad they're just bad I I just need to rest like it's like on days where I'm having flare-ups it's my body's way of telling me to shut up and like just chill I think I also dream of a world where self Self-care is involved with community care and that we have the resources and structure to be able to build those things for each other. So I think for me, it's like having a health team that I really love. And it was like making sure that I felt really safe and secure with the health team that I have. So it's like I love my gynecologist that I've started working with with my endometriosis. Her name's Emily Blanton. She's amazing. She's at Maiden Late Medical. I'm just going to shout her out because I love her. She's a person of color. She believed me. She saw me. My PT, Millie, who's at MedBar here in Green point. Her name is Millie Gerlach. I love her too. She was also one of the first people who was like, hey, why don't we do this for you? Like you should go to a doctor that takes care of you. And I think gratitude for these people and and my support team is a big part of my life. And then it's also just like enjoying the small things. I take a lot of baths. I do a lot of float therapy. That's been fun. It does cost money, but it is a good experience. If you don't have that, then an Epsom salt bath works just as well. And so I'm a big bath person and I I'm a big giving yourself treats, but also just connecting and staying. I think slowing down has been the biggest self-care practice and like not succumbing to the capitalist BS of like what clock time does to us and feeling productive because it's like I'm really happy for you, too, that you have an employer that understands that like I'd be very shocked if like the employer that you have did not accommodate those things based off of what you were doing. But sometimes that's how it works. And I think parts of self-care are like acknowledging when something's not working for you sitting and slowing down I meditate a lot as well so sitting and slowing down and being mindful like somatic practices and going back to the body and retraining I really recommend those then also just like treating myself to fun things those are such good like you touched on like 25 different like important points baths yeah. slowing down having a, a healthcare team that you trust and that you know you're going to be good with and communicate with treats like come on like my partner and I when I go get one of my treatments in Philly we have a treat day after it's like treats for treat like it's just it's the little things that like really make a difference like I'm gonna give myself a little treat for being at the migraine for two weeks and just yeah community like that has been a theme throughout this entire conversation and it's so important so thank you for bringing us back and grounding us into the things that matter and I we're gonna wrap up here so I just want to thank you Krista for coming on the podcast 
podcast talking to us and I hope you have a great rest of your June and yeah thanks for coming on thank you so much for having me and I loved sharing this and the nice thing about these things too is like now we are part of community together right and it, it's good because it means that there's more space to be shared more stories to be told and more resources that we can now share with each other and I find that to be so beautiful and especially during this month our month of pride our month yeah I think community is probably one of the biggest things that keeps both queer people and disabled and chronically ill people like afloat and when you have these beautiful intersections that match I think that it really sparks something beautiful and noticing and acknowledging the like care and work that we've both put into our separate journeys is also a very miraculous kind of magical thing I like to find magic in the mundane and that's another self-care tip is just like find magic in your everyday like everything is magical magic in the mundane maybe that's what we're gonna call this episode <laughs> <laughs> amazing thank you for listening to this episode of talking head pain the podcast that confronts head pain head on if you have any questions thoughts or suggestions for us you can send us an email at podcast at ghlf.org if you like this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating, write a positive review, and spread the word by sharing with your friends and family. It'll help more people like you find us. I'm Sarah Shaw, and I will see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Network.